and to be back in my old stomping grounds in the place where I grew up. Emily and I are so honored uh, to be here today. Um, Emily and I, we are uh, next month celebrating our four years of marriage, which I'm really uh, excited about. And uh, we are now coming up on being experts in marriage, all right? So if any of you, I see a lot of, a lot of people in here that probably need some advice, so I'll, I'll help out. We, we, we got it figured out. <laughs> definitely kidding, definitely kidding. Pull, pull us aside at lunch and give us all the advice you need. We, will, we would love to soak it up like a sponge, so that'd be good. But uh, I do want to thank you all, uh, not only for just letting me be here and, and be able to speak to you today, but also just for being such an awesome church. I see new faces in this crowd that I do not know, but I also see many faces um, that knew me when I was in diapers, right? And through awkward teenage years. And I just wanna say thank you so much for helping raise me into the man that I am today. Um, a lot of what I get to do in the ministry that I'm a part of, I learned a lot of the best traits on how to do it from many of you in this room. So I'm very, very, very appreciative of that. Um, I also wanna thank you so much for how you love and cared for my family in a very hard time a couple years ago with my dad, um, who was uh, really sick with COVID in the hospital. Many of you um, came around, not just us as a family, through either financial or just food or whatever it be, but just the prayers and uh, mom staying with me and Emily in Lynchburg, uh, just the, the notes and the letters and the constant praying and visits and things like that. We are forever uh, just uh, indebted to you for that. So thank you again so much for that. And, and Rick, last of all, thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak. Um, I do not take that lightly, um, just being here uh, for Homecoming Sunday. And I um, also wanna thank you so much for um, your dedication to this body. Um, you are an awesome shepherd to this flock. Um, a lot of the things that I try and carry into ministry today comes a lot from uh, some of the ways that I saw you lead here, and I know that you're still leading today. So know that you all are in the best of hands, and you've been in the best of hands. Never take this man and his wife, Karen, for granted, because they are incredible, incredible. Um, so, and, and you never let me down, except for that one time. <laughs> you left me at the soccer field. I kid you not. This was in my notes to say. <laughs> Because I'm pretty sure in my time here, it's been used twice from the pulpit, but now I can say three times, and now four, <laughs> that story, at least in, in when I've been present in this building. Um, so but yes, as uh, Pastor Rick said, I am a family pastor at Waymaker Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. I've been a part of that church for the past five or six years. I've been in this role specifically for the past few years, um, and I love it. I get to oversee a team of awesome people as we get to minister to um, hundreds of families around uh, a little over 300 uh, kids between the ages of birth to graduating high school. And uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. And uh, so I'm heavily immersed in the culture of the next and new generations that are rising up. And uh, it is a crazy, crazy world that we live in. Um, but I also have immense hope in this crazy world, not because of the world, but because of what Jesus wants to do in it through generations. And I believe today, and what we're going to be talking about in the scripture that we're going to go through, I believe that all of us here, no matter the age, have a part to play in it. And um, I hope that uh, we are challenged, but at the same time, I hope that we are encouraged because I believe even in just how I have feel, felt so welcomed in this church today. Um, that you have something more um, for the world that is around you in the name of Jesus. So with that, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for the fact that um, we get to be here today, that we get to be in a church, in a building where we get to praise your name, where we get to see friends and family, but also we get to uh, just learn from you. And God, I pray that you would use me as a vessel um, and that everything that I say would be of your word and of you. And Jesus, I pray that we will all leave um, knowing what you did for us on the cross and how it is what we cling to every day, but also that our lives are meant to be a sacrifice for you as well. So Jesus, I pray that we would all walk away challenged but encouraged by your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you have your Bible with you this morning, you could turn to Matthew chapter 22. We're gonna be in verse 34. Matthew 22 verse 34. Today, we are looking at a very interesting moment in Jesus's life on this earth. Um, 
Here we're going to be seeing uh, him teaching about a foundational command that I believe influences how we, as followers of Jesus, should live today. It's going to sound really familiar, but I believe that there is a lot to unpack with that. But before we, we jump into reading it, just make sure you get your, your spot there, I do want to set up this passage. So at this point, uh, Jesus is teaching and answering many questions mainly asked by Pharisees and Sadduce- Sadducees just a few days before Jesus is to be crucified on the cross. Uh, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were considered to be experts in Old Testament law, um, but were known to be religious leaders that were a little bit corrupt with their power. They were a little bit too rigid and tend to uh, be more to drive people out of churches and create outcasts. And there was really no harmony. Didn't really look a lot like heaven, but they had a lot of power within that. And also the Pharisees and the Sadducees were kind of at odds with one another. They were enemies in the regard of they both understood scripture in the Old Testament, but they both had different methodology on how that looks like. So they were constantly at odds with one another, but they did find common ground in one thing in particular. And then the fact that they were really angry with Jesus during his time here on earth. They were really uh, offended and, and kind of flabbergasted by his claims that he was God's son and that he was God himself. The savior and Messiah that they envisioned, they thought was going to be this military leader that was going to literally destroy all their enemies. But here comes this, this pacifist shepherd who is preaching love and a bunch of different things like that. Um, But he's also taking a lot of the things that the religious leaders are doing, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and telling them that they're actually getting it wrong and missing a lot of the points that the law and what God was trying to do in his people. So these two enemies have now found an enemy in Jesus. So the saying is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they are teaming up, throwing everything they can at Jesus, trying to stump him and trying to prove that he does not no, nor is he everything that he claims to be by testing him with the scriptures, which Jesus was an expert of. And there we bring us to Matthew 22, verse 34. Verse 34 states, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And we'll, we'll pause there and, and continue on in a minute. So the question to try and stump Jesus was, what is the greatest commandment? And they asked this question because as experts of the Old Testament, they definitely have an opinion on that. But Jesus gives another opportunity here to show that he truly knows Old Testament law and scripture. And there are hundreds of different laws to know. And he even pinpoints what is to be the centric foundational one of these. Um, and that was the, the answer that he gave gave there. He actually gave it from Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. You don't have to go there, Um, but he quotes it literally and says, uh, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And Jesus knows this because everything following that verse says things of the like of you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So every other command that was to come was based after this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and this is what he gives to them. So Jesus gives a really good answer, and logically you think he could move on, right? That's a really good answer, but Jesus actually continues by giving a second command. And what's interesting here is that he does this because now he's about to take these religious leaders and their understanding of scripture and take them to a deeper truth that is closer to the heart of God. So if we go back, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great, greatest commandment. And then verse 39, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. He gets this one from Leviticus chapter 19, which is filled with law. And then verse 40, The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. 
So Jesus answered with not one, but two commandments. Two that we know pretty well. So I remember learning this when I was a kid and having this first memorized at a certain point to love your God, but then also the famous love your neighbor as yourself. These two commands that Jesus brings to this Pharisee is more than just an answer. It is a lesson, but it's not just for him, but it's for the entire church, all of God's people for the rest of time. And I believe it is for us today And I believe it is desperately needed in today's culture, especially in the generations that are to come, the generations that we are still continually imparting wisdom and we are continually raising in our own seasons of life. So yes, we are learning how to love today, but we are not learning how to love the way that the world would define it. We are learning how to love the way that Jesus displays it and the way that he defines it. Because loving God, as followers of Jesus, I know many of us in this room are, is easy in, in good seasons. It can be really difficult in seasons that are very hard or when we get asked to do something very uncomfortable. But that command to love your neighbor, all <laughs> your neighbors, right? Like not just like the ones that you like, but we're also talking about the people in our community, the ones that are far from Jesus, the ones that are opposite from our personality, that may share different values or, or different beliefs, taboo the most, probably even different politics, all of those things, right? Can be very, very difficult to love, but Jesus is asking us to step into that danger. But how is Jesus asking us to love others? Before we answer this, we need to know first, what is this love we're talking about and why it is so important? So we are going to define Jesus's definition of love, but I want you to bear with me for a moment. I think it's important before we define that, we need to see what the world's definition of it is. And I know that we're, it's like love, defining love should be a very simple thing, but um, when we look at scripture and we look at words and we really try and see how they're used in culture, you, you can be surprised as to what it actually conveys. So let's talk about the world's de- definition of love and see how it is going to be different from what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 22 and the other gospels where the word love is used. So the world dictionary, I look this up on the internet, um, would say that love is three different Uh, definitions. One that probably most common that we can relate to is an intense feeling of deep affection for someone or for something. A second definition is a great interest or pleasure in something. And this third one, I think, is holding a lot more of a root in how we use this word today in this culture, is to like or enjoy very much. To like or enjoy very much. We're starting to see that even in definition that like is starting to become synonymous with the word love. But when we look at the Bible, there could not be a further difference between the two. But this is how the world defines love. The obvious love that we understand in today's world is the type of deep affection that you would have in marriage or the deep affection that you would have with a family member. Um, Sometimes a deep affection that you might have with a pet I know for some people, pets are a means to an end. Emily and I may or may not treat our cat Piper as if she is our firstborn daughter. Um, We may or may not uh, have this automatic feeder that feeds her three times a day. We may or may not have a mug that says cat mom and cat dad on it, okay? For dog lovers in the room, I love dogs too, so let's, why can't we like both? Uh, I feel the judgment, so we're gonna, we're gonna move forward, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> you do get what I'm saying about um, how we can have love for those things. But what we can also see is that the world's definition is a little bit deeper into this idea of liking something or wanting something being used with love. So, for example, we will say things like, I love food right? I love chicken. I love this. I love this type of food. I love all of that. And it's, we'll we'll use that all the time. Oh, I just love green beans and mashed potatoes. I love this. We'll say like, hey, I love this music artist. I love this worship song. I love this band. I love this thing because we really love the music when it comes on. I love that TV show or I love that movie. Many of us, I love sports, right? I love sports so much, right? I love college sports. I love My family grew up, we love UVA. And I know other people like that other team in Virginia. So, 
Uh, we won't need to go there, though. But the list goes on and on. We will claim and paste love for so many different things. But really, we are just saying we like it very much, but there's actually something deeper happening there. Because at the end of the day, do you love that food? Or do you just like how it tastes and the benefit you get from it? Do you love that show or that movie or that band or that song or that artist? Or do you just like how when you consume it and how it makes you feel? And this is where it started to bleed heavily into a dangerous place in culture. Do you love that person or do you just like what you are getting out of the relationship and the benefits within it? This is how today's culture will define love, and it has crept its way even into the church and how we use the word love. So if we're gonna look at this word love in this context, we can't look at it in any way, shape, or form like that because God's version of it is so much deeper. This love is something that the world has defined as partaking in things and relationships where we are the ones that selfishly benefit. That is what it has come to. Love is being directly connected with the question, what is in it for me? That is what it's become. And it's bled into a lot of thinking and a lot of relationships. And could this love that scream what's in it for me be a huge reason why divorce stats are going through the roof? Could it be a reason that people, younger generations, are just choosing not to marry? Because why bother? It's inconvenient, right? Could that be a reason why we're having so many gender identity issues in today's culture? And I'm not going to open that can of worms, but it's coming from a place of trying to find a love for even ourself screaming, what's in it for me? How can I find validation? But when we find it outside of Jesus, it just spirals more and more down. Could this be the reason I believe it has a lot to do with it? This is a broken and fallen world. And it's fueled by the name of live your truth and you do you. The love the world teaches is a false love. But the love that Jesus teaches is one that changes everything. As a family pastor, I work with kids and parents all the time about the chaos that is today's culture, and it's scary, and it's dark. It's a modern-day Babylon, which in, in Scripture, that is a city most commonly referred to as pretty much a hell on earth. And this is what I see in, in my generation and in younger generations coming after me, is uh, just being immersed in this. And it's a lot of worldly ideas that are completely against what Scripture teaches and what we're going into today. And it would be far easier for devout and, and Christian families and parents and followers and grandparents, all of the like, it would be much easier and far safer to just completely remove ourselves from the culture. It would be easier to just judge it or ignore it or maybe do both in some way, shape, or form and just wait until Jesus comes back or wait until the day he calls us home. That does sound safer and it does sound more comfortable, but how are we supposed to respond when we see Jesus say in Matthew 22, 39, love your neighbor as yourself, and everything is based off of this. The world may seem too far gone, and scripture tells us that is its destination, is it's going to get worse before it gets better until the day Jesus comes back. But we as the church are here now on purpose for Jesus. And we must look at today's culture and generations that are, are current and the ones that are coming after us, knowing that God has called us to reach them and to love them. But not a love that screams, what's in it for me? But by showing them the love of Jesus that we have in our heart. And that is what Jesus is all about. So now... Thanks for bearing with me. We're going to go into defining what Jesus says love is. So in this specific text in Matthew 22 and all the other gospels, love is this Greek word agape. Okay? This translates directly to love in English. Um, but what's really cool about this word agape is that usually definitions from Greek, especially from Hebrew Old Testament, is usually just a direct translation and a direct definition of things before. But agape does not go to the old Hebrew word, which is ahava. They have different definitions. And the reason being is because 
what Jesus defined as love did not match the definition of the Hebrew word ahava. It was a little bit different. So this is a unique word that is defined by the gospel authors in a way that is just observing what Jesus did. And this is how they define agape love. Sacrificially seeking after the well-being of others without expecting anything in return. Countercultural. The world says, what's in it for me? That type of love. And what we see from Jesus is sacrifice. Think about the well-being of others and don't expect anything in return. And Jesus, in multiple different times in Scripture, actually points that one of the best ways that this is done is when we show it to the people that it's hardest to, meaning the people that may disgust us or even the people that we may find as an enemy against us. This is the person that has the different belief than you. This is the person that is across the political aisle from you. This is the person that, a common old phrase is, the person that smokes and drinks and chews and hangs out with those who do, right? Like those are the people that we commonly will find ourselves wanting to distance ourselves from, to protect ourselves from, to protect our families from, and all of that is in an understanding place. But we are preventing ways when we do that for Jesus through us to do something incredible by showing that love. So now, we're going to go through Matthew 22 again, but we're going to look at it knowing what Jesus is calling love here. And we're going to see what the implications are because of that, and also what they do not mean. And I think it's very telling. So, Matthew 22, verse 34. Love, agape, love your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. This means that we don't love God so our heart can get what it wants or needs. That's not the end goal. We don't love God so that our soul just gets its ticket to heaven. That's not the end goal. We do not love God so that way our mind can be transformed to be some form of wisdom or sage or things like that so that way we can look like that we have all the answers. It is a benefit that we get this wisdom from God, but it is not the end goal. What we do is we love our God with an agape love that Jesus has. We love our God so that God's heart can transform our own, just like when we came to follow him, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore you're a new creation in Christ. Your heart has to transform. Many of us in this room have experienced that. We love God so that way God's will for our soul can be his and not ours and our plans and what we think is best. And we ask for God's mind to transform our own, just like Romans 12, 1, so that way we can think of things of him and we can think about his perspective and not our own bias and our own flesh because it will lead us to a path of selfishness and destruction. That is the type of love we have for our God. So it puts us in even a sacrificial place with the same God who sacrificed everything for us. And then verse 39, we must love, agape love, our neighbors as ourselves. Not to love our neighbors so that way we can feel good about ourselves, which is a common motivator that I will struggle with. Or to be known in our community as a good person. Or so that way we can bend people to act in the way that we believe is best and more godly and more honoring and all those things. Because God's got them on a different journey and wants you to just show them love. Nor does it mean that we have to go to another extreme where we love them instead of ourselves because we have our truth and our foundation in Jesus that we must stand on. And we must defend, but we do it in love and we treat other people as if we were looking in the mirror and seeing our humanity and our sin as well. And that we are on the same page. A phrase that I I love to picture a lot is that no matter if you've been following Jesus for 60 plus years or if you're new in faith or today is the first day that you came to follow Jesus, the ground is level at the foot of cross because we all are in the same desperate need of him.
The way that we show agape love to others is to actually care about their lives, to care about their families, to care about their struggles, to care about their insecurities. We are looking for ways to sacrifice our preference so that that way they might experience God's agape love in their own life. If the Pharisees were to ask, you gave us two commands, love God and love your neighbor, which is more important? It seems that Jesus would say, yes, it's both. They're intertwined. The more you love God, the more you love others. The more that you love others, the more you will show that you love God. That is truly the only measure that we can really have when it comes to our relationship with Jesus because at the end of the day, it is not how much we know or how many spiritual disciplines that we might practice in our life. All those things are important, but without it being rooted in the agape love of Jesus that he displayed on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection, and what that means for us to follow in step with him, then we've missed the point. The measure of faith is love. And when we focus on love, a measure doesn't even matter. What if our goal in life as we follow Jesus And we ask ourselves every year this question, am I displaying God's agape love in my life to my family, to my neighbors, to my enemies? Imagine what good could be done in this world in the name of Jesus. We are called to live a life a love. So as I close, why why would I teach this? Why, Why do I believe this is important? It's because I mean, our culture is in desperate need of more people who are living a life of agape love. Younger generations are being more influenced by a dark and corrupted world than ever before. The enemy has its claws deep in it. And families are being overwhelmed by it. Parents are are fearing for their children from it. And I see it all the time in my ministry. But what I'm also seeing is families and kids and the next generation searching for a true and authentic love They just don't know how to articulate it because the world's definition is wrong. They don't know where to find it because it is in Jesus, but Jesus has been painted as a picture that may not have all the answers in today's society. What they need is it to be proven by our active love that we experienced when we came to know Jesus. It's like falling in love with our first love all over again, the gospel of Jesus Christ and let it motivate and flow through every single thing that we do. So what does this mean? This means that we find the hard people to love in Farmville, in Buckingham, and wherever you drove from today. For me and Emily, it's in Forest, Virginia, right? We are looking for those people so that way we can show them that same sacrificial love that Jesus did on the cross for all of us. And if you do not know that love, today I hope that you would have a conversation with, maybe with me or or Pastor Rick, we would love to talk to you about that, so that way you can experience that same love as well. And the reason I share this with you guys, I know that it sounds a lot like a challenge, and it is. It's a challenge every single day that if we were to to read this. But I say it because I have immense hope in this church. The moment that Emily and I walked in, we had to stand up almost every five seconds because another person was there to greet us and to welcome us and to make us feel like family, I, the, the laughter that filled this room with stories that were being told even in the midst of transitions of, of different parts of this service, the way that you cared for my family in a time of need, the way that I've seen many different times growing up, the way that you guys do this, you guys have such a depth and capability of love that is the true agape love of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you today, as someone who is working with hundreds of families, 300 plus kids and teenagers every single week, they need wisdom from people who have experienced the beauty and the hard things of life, but have worked and walked through it with Jesus and show them the way that it's his love and his love alone that can get us through all things. I believe that this church can help carry that torch because it's taught me so well how to do that in my own life. So my challenge for all of us today is this. Let's find comfort in getting uncomfortable for the love of Jesus Christ. Let's think sacrificially and let's learn to adopt love, but an agape love as we love our God and love our neighbor and let us be people who live a life 
of love rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I thank you so much for um, today. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for your truth. And I thank you so much for your death, burial, and resurrection that saved us from our sins, that defeated death, so that way we can live in freedom and no chains, and that we can spend eternity with you. But most importantly, that we can have access to your love in our hearts through your spirit every way and every day and everywhere we go. We thank you so much for this. It's your name we pray, amen.